we've just thought through the economic consequences of the government regulating prices through price ceilings, where price ceiling sets a maximum price above which markets aren't allowed to price. The opposite of a price ceiling is a price floor. And again, a price floor is exactly what it sounds like. The government sets a floor for the price below which the market is not allowed to price. And a common example of that happens in agriculture policy, where the government wants to ensure farmers of a certain price that lies above the equilibrium price. So let's think, for example, about the market for corn. Now, if the government imposes a price floor in this market, and it imposes that price floor below the equilibrium price, that would have no effect at all. Because the policy says you can't charge below that price. If you set it below the equilibrium price, the market doesn't want to price below that price anyways. So that policy would have no effect. In order for a price floor to have an effect, it has to be set above the market equilibrium price. So suppose the government sets a price floor here. So this is the price floor. And the government says prices aren't allowed to drop below that. Well, now what's going to happen in the picture? We can read off the demand curve how much corn consumers or households demand. So the quantity demanded is going to shrink as we move up the demand curve as the price rises. What about farmers who supply corn? Well, at that higher price, they would want to provide more corn than they did before. So the quantity supplied would increase. So now we have more corn being produced than consumers want at the price floor. We have what we can call a surplus. But just as the shortage under a price ceiling can't possibly be an equilibrium, this can't possibly be an equilibrium. An equilibrium is when everybody's doing the best they can given what everybody else is doing. But here we have a bunch of farmers producing corn that they can't sell. That can't be an equilibrium. So we're going to call this a disequilibrium surplus. Now what's likely to happen to resolve this disequilibrium and reach an equilibrium? Well now it's the farmers, the suppliers or the firms who have an incentive to engage in effort. They are getting stuck with a bunch of corn that nobody is buying. So they are going to engage in effort. So firms, or in our case farmers, engage in effort to bring their goods to market. To reach those limited numbers of consumers who are willing to buy at the price floor. That effort is costly. It's going to impose costs on farmers in addition to those of just producing the corn. They might have to drive faster to the market, get up earlier in the morning. They might have to spend more on advertising to get customers to realize that they have a lot of corn that they want to sell. They may have to do all sorts of things in order to be able to get to the limited number of consumers. And those additional marginal costs will now have to be figured into their marginal cost curves. So the marginal cost for farmers is going to increase. And remember that the market supply curve is just composed of the individual supply curves of firms, and those are just composed of portions of marginal cost curves. So when the marginal costs of farmers are going up, because the additional effort they have to engage in to bring that corn to market, then the supply curves of those firms are rising, which means the market supply curve is rising. And as that market supply curve shifts up, or shifts to the left, the intersection of that supply curve with demand is going to move up. The price that the market would charge is going to move up if the market could charge below the price floor. And we're not going to reach an equilibrium until that supply curve shifts all the way to the point where we end up here, where the quantity supplied is exactly equal to the quantity demanded at that price. So we'll get a new supply curve 
that's higher than the original supply curve because the additional marginal cost it takes to bring those goods to the limited number of consumers. We can see in this picture how big that effort cost is. It's the vertical difference between these two supply curves. Just like when we imposed a tax on firms, the difference between the two supply curves was equal to the per unit tax. After all, a per unit tax also imposes an additional marginal cost on firms. So we can read off the equilibrium effort cost as this vertical distance below the new equilibrium down to the original supply curve. And again, we have a fairly cluttered picture. So let's unclutter it. Let's just take what we need. We have corn on the horizontal axis, the price of corn on the vertical, and the original demand and supply curves with the original equilibrium price and quantity. Then the price floor is imposed above the equilibrium price. And we know we're going to end up at an equilibrium here once the supply curve has shifted due to those additional effort costs. We're going to end up here, and instead of shifting curves, we can just draw in that equilibrium effort cost. And now we can ask, who is paying and receiving what price? The consumers are certainly paying the price floor. That's the price they have to pay to the farmers. That's why they've cut back on the quantity that they demand. So this is, in fact, the price that consumers pay. But is that the price that the firms, the farmers, are receiving? Well, not once we net out the additional effort costs that they had to engage in in order to be able to sell those bushels of corn. So we have to go down by the effort cost to find the net price that the firms are actually receiving once we take into account their effort costs. So once again, we have a kind of a puzzle. If this policy was imposed in order to raise prices for farmers, the policy doesn't seem successful. The price that farmers actually get, once we account for their costs of bringing goods to market, is below what the equilibrium price was before the policy was imposed. So farmers shouldn't like this policy nor will consumers like the policy because they now have to pay a higher price for corn. So why would anyone pass such a policy in the real world? Well, it turns out in the real world, people realize that this will be the consequence of the policy. Less corn will be produced. The price for farmers will fall and the price for consumers will rise. And so governments typically complement this policy with another policy. So let's redraw this graph put corn on this axis, the price of corn on this axis, our original demand and supply curves. We have our original equilibrium price before the policy and the original equilibrium quantity. Then we can put in the price floor and we know that the quantity demanded by, con by consumers is going to fall And the quantity that farmers would supply if they did not have to engage in additional effort costs would be larger. That's what gives us that disequilibrium surplus. But now the government often does the following. It'll say, we'll impose this price floor and we will guarantee to the farmers that we'll buy any bushels of corn that they can't sell. So if you can't sell it to the consumers, the government will buy it. Well, in that case, is there still an incentive to engage in additional effort to bring the goods to the limited number of, of consumers? Well, no, because if you don't get it to the consumers, you can always sell it to the government at the price floor. So in that case, we wouldn't see a shift in the supply curve. Instead, we would get firms producing the quantity supplied at that price floor. So the total quantity in the market would increase. Consumers would buy the limited quantity at the price floor. And the difference is what the government 
purchases. So if we complement this price floor with a government guarantee that they will buy whatever farmers can sell, then in fact the government is successful at raising the price that farmers receive to the price floor. It will also continue to be the price that consumers pay. So consumers may not like it, but farmers would like that policy.